Live from the Talking Joe Studios. It's Talking Joe. Talking Joe Weekly Podcast. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe thought we would last. Talking Joe is there. Find each other like a married couple. A podcast on the air. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe is the code name for a completely untrained special podcast force. Its purpose, to produce a regular comic review show while breaking and replacing a series of presenters from across the world. Talking Joe. Talking Joe is there. Talking Joe. We are on our soapbox. Nobody seems to care. Fighting for fandom wherever there's trouble But the podcast's on the air Talking Joe is there Talking Joe Talking Joe Talking Joe is on the air Hey, 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 boy. Hey, hey, girl. Superstar podcast. Here we go. It's me, Mark. And welcome to Talking Joe, the best and longest running dedicated G.I. Joe pomic... Uh, pomics? Todcast? Comics podcast. If you're new to the show, you can find the details over at the website talkingjoe.co.uk. Today we are continuing our look at the G.I. Joe disavowed era, The Devil's Due Run. Today we are specifically talking about G.I. Joe Frontlines issue 20... Today we are specifically talking G.I. Joe Frontline issues 9 and 10, the arc family history from Devil's Due in 2003. Now without further ado, let me introduce my co-hosts and co-pilots on this journey leading the charge. It's a real American Tim. It's Tim Finn. Hello Mark and hello listeners. Hello, Tim. And here comes the reinforcements. It's G.I.J. Jay Cordray. Howdy, Joe fans. Who's ready to talk about some G.I. Joe? I am. I am. How, how are you bearing up, Jay, last time? Good, uh, good. You, you, had, you, were, you were in the sick bay. Yeah, yeah, a little under the weather for that one. I hated to miss it, too, because that was such a good story arc. I really, really liked that one. And, I, and when I read it, I was like, this is going to be a good one, you know, because I was... Yeah, it was just, I hated to miss it, but I hope it was good. I haven't listened to it yet. Um, looking forward to it like a fan for a change that, that, that gets to hear the episode uh, when it drops. So that's going to be fun. Something for me to look forward to. Uh, you were missed, but we did have a, a wonderful chat with Dan Jolly, writer of the previous arc of G.I. Joe Frontline. Good, good, yeah. good. So uh, I think we are ready to talk Frontline with our new jingle, kicking us off. Front line! Front line! Front line. There's talking behind comic scenes, behind the comic scenes. Mark, Jay, and Tim. It's the spin off that has survived. There's no yawning to find the meaning. Is it good? Is it shite? G.I. Joe, front line on. Talking Joe! Well, G.I. Joe, front line on. Talking Joe! G.I. Joe, front line on. Talking Joe, well, G.I. Joe, front line on. Talking Joe. Okie dokie, so <laughs> we are in 2003 today, uh, around about the issue 20 mark of the regular G.I. Joe series. Hmm. Um, the creative team of the book is writer Sean McKeever, pencils Francis Portella, inks Pierre André Derry, and Francis Portella, uh, colors Studio Din and Mita, and letters Dreamer Design, graphic design Mark Norton, and we have got some covers by Francis Manipal, Corey Hampshire, Din, and Mita. So let's have a look at those now. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. Jay, you you, you start us off. Okay. Um, I do like these covers, although at first glance, I thought maybe Zanya was getting ready to deliver a baby on this one. Um, But I do like, (laughs) I do, I like them. I think that they look really nice. Um, There's kind of something, again, with the coloring, and this is an issue that we have all the time with devils do 
but we'll get into that once once we once we dig into the story more. The first cover I like, uh, you know, because you get to see some dreadnoughts on it, and, and and the ones that we didn't get to see with what was it issue ten of the regular series where we had Buzzer Ripper Torch Monkey Wrench was on that one, I guess. Uh, but we do get Monkey Wrench, Nogahide, Zanzibar, and those must be the equivalent of Dreadnought green shirts in the background. I don't know who those guys are. But yeah, the first cover is really cool. I like the second one, too, where she's on top of the crate and she's uh, kind of leaning down. I do like these covers. I like both of them. I really, other than the covers or the colors on that first one, I don't have any complaints about uh, about these. Surprise, um, surprise. Uh, there's something about the cover to issue nine that doesn't work for me at first blush. I like this cover because, uh, uh, you know, we have this spotlight character and then we've got recognizable favorite characters around and behind her. And, you know, she's doing something. She's, you know, tightening a glove. Like she's, you know, just had a fight or about to have a fight. And then there's this big burst of yellow orange behind her. Um, but then I, I realized I don't quite know what's going on in the cover. So I looked down at the bottom and, One, there's a logo in the way, but two, Mm -hmm. I see a head on the left and I see another head on the right and uh, these two people, their eyes are closed and they look like, you know, sort of biker guys or tough guys. One's bald and has uh, an eyebrow ring and the other has a a hat or a bandana, but they're uh, sleeping unconscious dead uh resting because they just got beaten up and <laughs> the, the actual so there's a difference between drawing and illustration the drawing in this cover is good the illustration which is to say a drawing that tells a story is not so good because uh, yes i understand from the logic of this cover like oh she just beat these guys up um these other dreadnoughts are examining it impressed right you know there's a little there's the body language with uh, with monkey wrench looking um, under from under his sunglasses but there's so little of these two guys on the bottom that like everything about this cover needs to be moved up a little bit or we need to pull back a little bit i need to see more of these two guys their poses like a, like a bruise or a bloody nose or um that one of them is you know doubled over clutching his stomach in pain i just see part of a head and part of a head and then compositionally, like one of them lines up with her left leg and the other lines up with her right leg. And then again, with sort of the coloring on their heads, they disappear in conjunction with that logo that covers them up. Uh, you know, Jay, I take your joke that it looks like, you know, her pose, like she's tightening a glove as if she's a, a doctor or a medical professional about to do some um, procedure. But I think what's actually slightly embedded in that joke is... Um, that this this drawing is not as clear as it could be. So I like this cover, but when I start to think about it, I don't think it works. The cover to issue 10, it's a good drawing of Zanya, but once again, it's a good drawing and there's no story. Zanya is on a wooden crate in a warehouse. She's looking at something I don't know what. Um, she's intent and she has a, a fist ready uh, and she's got brass knuckles on her uh, right hand. And then there's a shadow on the front left side of this uh, wooden crate. It's not hers. She's not casting that shadow. It's something or someone. And I'm guessing it's the shadow of a head. But I have no idea how high up she is, what she's looking at. Um, If it's one person or two people, if it's weapons, if it's uh, bad guys being terrible or good guys and she's a bad guy. And, um, you know, I think of that... Mike Zek cover uh, is it uh, is it Jaja forty seven where um, Zartan is strangling Gung Ho uh, and there's a giant sign behind him right it's, it's forty eight like, I think forty eight thank you like you know pit level three or whatever like entrance um, there is so much story in that cover for four um, sort of vignetted elements like hand with gun head head sign like that camera isn't pulled back i don't see like the whole entrance i don't see their whole bodies i don't see a lot of body language i see like head head gun sign and yet that cover is filled with tension is drawn really well and is the camera is incredibly close so um the covers to nine and ten um they just sort of sit there they don't 
The cover to a comic book should ask a question. The inside should answer the question. Or more generally, the cover should tease the contents. Uh, I don't feel like a question is being asked of me here. I feel like just some information is being presented. You made a great comment about um, a person being able to be a good artist, but not necessarily a good illustrator. And yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to what we've talked about with storytelling. We've seen some really good artists that just don't tell a story that well. Yeah, and and we're 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 usually talking about sequential inside, yeah. but you know, telling a single story, telling a story in a single image, right? Like that's why not everyone in comics should draw covers. There, are, you know, there are there are artists who are really good at panel to panel continuity. And I should note, Francis Manipal does more GI Joe work later and becomes a great storyteller. Uh, you know, writer and and uh, penciler and inker. You know, like a big run on the Flash. He did the- Covers for uh, Dreadnoughts Declassified, I think. And, he did G.I. Joe things. Declassified, not not Dreadnoughts Declassified. Oh, it's the G.I. Joe one, okay. Uh, unless there's a variant of Dreadnoughts. No, I don't think so. Well, um, Manipul becomes, becomes great uh, later on. Here he's he's starting. Uh, just to note that Francis Manipul did indeed do some of the variant covers for Dreadnoughts Declassified. Aha, thank you. I thought there was at least one. Okay, so that is the covers, uh, but it's not all covers. Things happen inside the issue, and Jay is going to tell us about those things in the plot breakdown. In Chicago, a young street-tough girl named Zanya and a grifter named Kevin are running a hustle in backlot bare-knuckle fights. Kevin wants to con his way into joining the outlaw biker gang known as the Dreadnoughts, by winning bets placed on Xanya in the fights and then telling the Dreadnoughts he earned the money pulling robberies and various other illegal enterprises. Eventually, Kevin and Xanya do get in with the Dreadnoughts, but when Xanya sees Zartan, she realizes he is her long-lost father and challenges him to a fight. Reluctantly, Zartan subdues the girl and walks away. Later, Zartan's sister, Zarana, confronts him about the girl's claim to be his daughter. Zartan tells Zarana he was in Chicago around that time, so it could be true. The Dreadnoughts decide to test Zanya by sending her and Kevin on a fake mission with Zorana. Kevin tells Zanya that killing Zorana is her ticket to becoming heir to the Dreadnoughts and seemingly convinces her to take out Zorana. However, as Zartan hoped, Zanya turns on Kevin, beats him to a motionless pulp, and tells him to leave and never come back. After that, Zanya is mostly welcome to the Dreadnoughts, and everyone lives happily ever after except Kevin. So that that's the, the story, but um, where shall we go first? So um, before we get into the details of the story itself, I guess this, this story didn't come from any, just out of the ether. It was written by somebody. So that somebody was uh, Sean McKeever. So in the dev, in the letters page uh, preceding this, they, they tease it as, as being Sean McKeever of uh, Inhumans, Sentinel, and the Waiting Place fame. So, he in 2003 he, he he's been doing indie comics for a couple of years now, uh, and and is sort of just breaking you know breaking through into into Marvel on some uh, sort of modi- relatively modest books, but but showing uh, promise and does go on to uh, do an awful lot of work for for Marvel and then DC as well. Um, Particularly significantly, I guess, um, uh, Gravity, sort of introducing a brand new superhero into the Marvel Universe and, and sort of making a little bit of a splash with that, no mean, mean feat, and uh, some some work on the kind of manga-influenced uh, Spider-Man loves Mary Jane. So, yeah, sort of, you know, a lot of those sort of contemporaries from coming from indie books, sort of making it a little, making a bit of a splash and, and growing in uh, as into a Marvel writer. I'm thinking like Brian Wood and... Uh, Brian K. Vaughan and, and Michael Bendis and these kind of thing, guys in that era sort of coming up through uh, through the, the ranks, uh, although I don't think Sean McKeever kept quite the same traje- trajectory, uh, you know, beyond those mid-2000s. Uh, so that's who this uh, who this guy was, uh, some, some credibility there, but um, I don't know if he uh, quite had the chops on on this story itself in terms of keeping my interest i was aware of sean mckeever i hadn't read uh waiting place but i had heard of it um and because you know anyone who starts writing for marvel you, you you see their their previous credits 
Um, and uh, in the Bill Jemis, Joe Casada era at Marvel, these are the two people who led, led Marvel Comics out of bankruptcy in uh, 99, 2000, 2001. Um, Jemis was the publisher, president publisher, and Casada was the editor in chief. Uh, as Mark says, they were hiring all these indie writers. Um, so I didn't read uh, Inhumans, which I think has been reprinted as Young Inhumans. It's not the sort of Inhumans, the, the main cast that we, we know in the Marvel Universe. I had read Sentinel, which is basically the Iron Giant yeah. <laughs> in in the Marvel Universe. Uh, and there was a push, that was, that was a part of a push to do some uh, new characters that were young. Um, and uh, I really liked uh, Spider-Man Loves Mary Jane, uh, which was published originally as Mary Jane, uh, which came after this. That's a, that's a good book, and I'm glad Marvel's brought it back into print uh, in their low-priced line aimed at younger readers. Um, uh, so in terms of, in terms of art, um, this is the beginning of Francis Portella's comics career in America, and um, there's something a little familiar and recognizable about a style. And, and for me, if I can put it in context, so in the 90s, um, Joe Matarera is drawing comics at Marvel. He's drawing Uncanny X-Men. Uh, and DC hires Humberto Ramos to draw uh, Impulse. Both these guys are heavily influenced by manga. And other artists who are either influenced by manga or influenced by these two artists are also getting work at Marvel and DC in the uh, early in, in the in the late nineties and early two thousands. Um, and uh, go for it. I was gonna say that his art to me looked like, uh, and and I'm glad that you said Ramos because that was one of them. I thought it looked like, um, what if Humberto Ramos and Mike Raringo had a baby? Yeah, and it's that same kind of. There's parts in here where, as I'm reading it, I'm like, "Wow, that's a really good, that's a really good angle." That's you know, I'm all about the angles, um, and lighting, and and his foundational stuff is really good. It's really good, uh, but just the figures and stuff look a little too cartoony for my tastes, especially for a story that's. And this is going to be a big theme through this episode with me is. These are outlaw bikers. This is not Teletubbies or Barney or something that should be really colorful. And, you know, that's really the only, only issue that I had with it. Was I thought a, the art was a little more cartoony than, than what I would have liked. There's, yeah, there's a, the subject matters well in terms of, like, coming from an, you know, that sort of traumatized childhood. And oh, that yeah. Kind of thing. I mean, it, it really... A, a bit more grit, a bit more darkness, perhaps... Um, you know, the, and the, it the, gets darker the if you want to really the... think about it. The whole fact that you know, um, Zanya is, uh, you know, Zartan's a deadbeat dad. He he blew into town, did what guys do, and you know, it's like okay, well, this is adding a, a wrinkle, which we knew was there from the first, you know, uh, issue with with Zanya, but it's like. Yeah, now we, we really kind of got to got to get into it. And the conversation with uh, Zartan and Zorana, I thought was, you know, I mean, I think everybody reading this obviously is is old enough to to get these things. But like we've said before, it's it's not in the original Marvel run. You wouldn't have jokes about throwing up on somebody's aunt at a wedding because you drank too much. You're not going to have um, someone show up and say, "Hey, I'm your kid," uh, in the original in the original run because it just delves too much into mature territory and like you said the whole uh, pyromaniac thing i felt like that was something that that got kind of dropped it was i don't know I, I, that should have been a bigger part of it but yeah it, it could this could have been a really dark story if they if they wanted to yeah, the pyro the pyromania didn't really sort of quite land because they tease it from page page one that, that you know, yeah. there's the fire and she's and then she has the conversation where she's like oh they died in a fire and it's like ooh okay but yeah, then yeah. they and kind then of sort brush of it off later at, hitting at some mild arsony kind of in the and playing with matches as they're going along and then yeah. the sort of the payoff is right near near the back that she says that her her mum and partner died died in a fire and this insinuation is that 
you know, Zanya lit that fire and then watched them burn, essentially. But I don't think that quite lands. And the ramification of quite what that means as for her as a character, I also yeah. don't know if that, that quite And there's lands. a scene where the, the uh, they go with the Dreadnoughts and they... Um, wipe out the wipe out like there's scenes where uh it's either naga hide or, or monkey wrench are like just straight up blasting these guys and yeah like i said it i mean this is this it it could have been it could have been um much different if the art were different i want to i want to swing back and just mention one more artist um in terms of context in uh in 1999 there's a a Dark Horse uh, miniseries written by Peter David and penciled by Pop Mahan mm-hmm. and inked by Norman Lee, which is if the Matarera and Ramos examples are sort of too far back in the timeline, although they're still working in 2003, of course, uh, or sort of too exaggerated. Um, if you if you remember Spy Boy, which ran from Dark Horse and then there was a crossover with uh, with Young Justice, um, that is this like mid two thousands style that uh, is sort of half like American comics and half manga in terms of uh, storytelling and and like the cartooniness of of shapes and there's a there's a smoothness and a prettiness to to characters um, and Mark hit on this this important four letter word that starts with a G grit. Um, that's missing from this story. And I think it, it goes a step further. Um, uh, I'd be happy around 2003 to see Francis Portella draw a G.I. Joe story for Devil's Due. Here, he is miscast for this story. You know, you think about, sometimes you see a movie or a TV show and one actor sticks out. Um, you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, it's like um, sometimes it's sometimes it's the lead, you know, like Stallone or Schwarzenegger is sort of like the one person who you sort of can't believe is uh, like this kind of action hero or problem solver. And sort of everyone else is sort of more grounded or realistic. Or sometimes it's a it's like a celebrity cameo or sometimes it's just someone like in, in the supporting role. Um, Star Trek Discovery. Perfect example. Uh, th- there are actually that's uh, Star Trek in general. Lo- you know, lots of the movies, someone sort of sticks out, um, mm-hmm. and um, there and there are all sorts of mitigating uh, or or complicating factors, right? Like you know, maybe the studio says oh, we we need someone exciting in this role, or maybe the casting director you know like had a bad day and everyone else works. Maybe the director just gave that one actor sort of the wrong suggestion that day, or maybe the editor picked the wrong take. Um, uh, in terms of comics. Um, you know, I think people sometimes say, I don't like this person's art. I think we less often say, I don't think this person was the right artist for this project. And this is a completely random example, but my favorite go-to example of this for the last 10 years is when Matt Fraction, at the same time is, for Marvel, uh, writes a really quirky FF run, like this Fantastic Four spinoff book, Back on Earth, and the main Fantastic Four book, which is out in uh, space. And Mike Ulred draws the really quirky FF monthly, which is great. And Mark Bagley draws the regular book, which is also quirky. And Mark Bagley is a great comics artist, um, drawn a lot of stuff for Marvel. One of those artists that you figure can sort of draw anything. But there are lots of comics that I actually would never put Mark Bagley on. I would never have him draw a Predator story. I would never have him draw... um, uh, I wouldn't have had him draw that Fantastic Four story. So I'm looking at this this G.I. Joe frontline arc, and because the art is pretty, because there's no grit... Um, it doesn't work. But also, I wonder, because Mark makes the, the point about this the Pyromania story uh, beat not landing. Uh, you know, we talked to Josh Blaylock, who, who mentioned that dealing with Hasbro could be difficult because um, there's this, like, there's a sexiness in G.I. Joe and there's a, there's, there's a sort of viciousness in G.I. Joe in some of the villains. And people at Hasbro who may have been approving things were uncomfortable with that or unfamiliar with that. Um, and I wonder if some of the story got some pushback and, you know, or, or preemptively sort of editorial Blaylock at, at, at Devil's Due 
Uh, I wonder if some dialogue was sort of changed or not written, uh, which would have, in a, in a different version of the story, in an earlier draft, which would have made more clearly sort of, there's no closure on the pyromania thing. Uh, it's, it's left for the audience to, uh, to, to connect the dots. And not in a way that like, well, comics is a visual medium. You can show it, not tell it. It's not quite shown or told. And also, I don't think that in any of her other appearances so far that it's been alluded to that she's a firebug. So it's like this just kind of came out of nowhere. Yeah, and we we should we should put a pin in this the three of us. And as we look at additional Devil's Due issues, you know, does this ever come back? Does yeah. does she is she holding a match? Is she like hanging out <laughs> with Torch, and not the other Dreadnoks? <laughs> you know, is she like hanging out by the back of the Thunder Machine? Because he's like throw it, show under his 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 tank that he wears on his back and stuff. So, uh, um. My, my overall, my, my top line, my one sentence review of the story is, I like this story. I don't like it as a G.I. Joe story. It's a hard one for me to really, um, like when we get to the ratings, I, I, I still don't really have a good, uh, you know, uh, idea what I'm going to give it. Because, like I said, um, the artist I feel is a good artist, but like you said, I agree he's he's miscast for this. Um, and the story, there I, there were problems I had with the story, but I, I enjoyed it when I was reading it, and I liked Zanya a lot by the end uh, for some reason. Uh, so I I did enjoy it, even though I really have I really really had a problem with just the impetus for the story. Here's a guy that somehow she's hooked up with who's wearing a leather jacket and like a collared shirt. And I mean, he look, he looks like Vinny Vega or something from, you know, Pulp Fiction or or Get Shorty. And seemingly all he wants to do is party with outlaw bikers. I'm like, they would eat him. I'm like, he has no idea what he's in for. And his idea is to con his way into this group that he just doesn't fit in with at all and i don't know whether that's something that the artist drew him to look like that or whether that was something that the writer put in but the whole just the whole idea you're that someone is anyone is is gonna con themselves into a biker gang because bikers throw the best parties so jay is the worst story idea i've ever heard so I, I, there is a party at the end of the story when uh, that's true when she is accepted, and certainly Kevin uh, Schulte is um, outclassed. Uh, he's he's not gonna he's not gonna make it right. He's not no. gonna make the team, or he's not gonna stay very very long if he does make the team. But um, when I read the story, uh, I didn't get quite as much of this thread of him wanting to party with them. As, I mean, he, he mentions says, it a couple of times in the first issue. Uh, pretty soon, girl, you'll be looking at the newest member of the Big Enchiladas, the Florida Dreadnoughts. Can you believe, man, can you believe it? Me, Kevin Schulte, working with the Originators, like pulling jobs with Zartan himself. It's like I can see my whole future laid out in front of me, you know? Um, taking big scores, truckloads of money, you at my side. Yeah, the crazy life. You'll see, Zanya. You'll see. Um... How would, are you, is it possible that, um, I, I don't take it just as partying. I mean, he's, he, he's, he's betting, he's, you know, he's betting on her fights. Right. Yeah. I, I do see it as like bank robbery and extortion and not just like music and dancing and food and beer. So I, I see partying as a more general, like, no, I'm, I'm going to be in this gang and we're going to, we're going to conduct criminal enterprise to make money and also be social with each other. <laughs> be social. Yeah, it's the, I think it's that it is mentioned a couple of times in the, in the book. And there's that party moment where they're all going wild with their individualized dreadnought beer tankards. Uh, Kevin says, this is where I always wanted to be. Crazy parties with the dreadnoughts, running jobs with them and stuff. I'm here. I'm family here. Yeah, so I, I think it's I think it's both. I think yeah. I think it's not just that he wants to uh, engage in uh, positive social interaction. Right, but the idea, <laughs> his idea that he's gonna 
bluff his way that in. He, yeah, he's yes. gonna, he's he's using Xanya to generate money, and then he's going to go to them and say, "Look, I got all this money by by pulling jobs, and so you need you should let me in on your crew." And it's like, you're dumb. The, the, <laughs> the very first time you go on a job with these guys, you're going to freak. And somebody's going to put a bullet in you, either one of the dreadnoughts or whoever you're trying to pull a job on. I'm, so I'm, I I love that because that is that's one of the kinds of irony where the, the audience knows something that the character doesn't. So yeah, in the moment we see him, you we, know, we think, oh, this guy's not good enough, not tough enough, and and McKeever's doing this on purpose because there is there is this contrast between Zanya and Kevin. She is absolutely tough enough. I mean. You forget for a second in in the f- scene where she's fighting that she's uh, Zartan's daughter, and you just see this uh, teenager, yeah. this teenager who's beating up these guys. Um, yeah, so and, so and who the crowd is underestimating, and and so it's delicious that we get to enjoy that Kevin is going to be at minimum, uh, he's not going to make the cut. At maximum, he'll be you know punished or killed or. Uh, sent away yeah i was gonna say he he's all all mouth and no trousers as it were whereas she's <laughs> she's all she's all that you know she's all about the toughness but with yep. really low confidence and self-esteem yeah yeah and, and i think that's what makes her likable she's not like you know she's vulnerable in in this arc she definitely is vulnerable she's you know she, she's afraid to assert her will around kevin um, she does step up to Zartan, but I think that's probably, you know, from years of him not being around. So there's a lot of uh, anger and resentment there, probably. And uh, and that scene is um, good. I, the, go ahead. The, I'm sorry. Yeah, the scene where she confronts Zartan and they fight uh, is great. And you know, again, I'm I, I'm sort of slamming the comic at the beginning of our of our review, um, and uh, you know the last. The last two pages are great. Great storytelling, great drama, great visual storytelling, great character. Uh, the final page is wordless. It's just, uh, plus the final panel on the previous page. It's just Xanya and Zartan seeing each other. Uh, it's, it's really well done. Uh, and then I get to the end, and then there's a nice pinup, and I think... Oh right, but I, I don't I don't like this character <laughs> in GI Joe comics because and, you know this goes back to our review of um, the very first arc of the Devils Do Run. Right. Um, I I think the visual and, of of Xanya is great. I think expanding the Dreadnoughts is great. I think expanding the Zartan family is great. However, but how they yeah the, well it, like but I at, said, at the at the expense of what like we don't we don't know enough about Xandar and Zarana. Why, two things. One, just make Zarana more interesting if you're going to have a tough female Dreadnought. And two, uh, again, this this thing about aging up the characters. It's like, well, in order for Zartan to have this, you know, 15, 18, 25-year-old daughter, now he's uh, 50. And then I'm just reminded of that first arc where he's in poor health, you know? And like, oh, I don't, like... Don't. Where he looks like Marlon Brando from the Island of Doctor Moreau. Yeah, like don't, you know, like I, I don't, I don't want to see, you know, and Bazooka's gained weight in the first arc. Like I don't. These are my, these are my sort of, even if they're like twenty and thirty and forty, and then the general's like fifty-five or something. I don't want to be reminded of characters growing old. I, I want them to be, you know, youthful and uh, vigorous. Um, and then this, this might be a lazy comparison. Um, but in terms of um, my, my fighting between enjoying a two-issue arc about a, a, a mistreated kid who asserts her agency and not caring about a G.I. Joe villain who I don't like as a mistreated kid, um, you know, I think of, of um, Patton Oswalt's stand-up about the Star Wars prequels, you know, like, like oh, Darth Vader. Oh, wow, I love Darth Vader. What, what a scary villain. Like, Oh yeah, let me tell you about his his origin. Uh, he's he's a scared little kid. What? Uh, oh, oh, uh, Boba Fett. Oh, Boba Fett, most feared bounty hunter in the universe. Oh, he's so cool. Yeah, I want to tell you about his origin. Oh really? Yeah, he's a scared little kid. What? Uh, oh, 
So again, that's, that's a joke and that's sort of a lazy comparison. But I was wondering when reading this arc, how would I feel if in the Devil's Due continuity, I read two issues about like Storm Shadow as a six-year-old and a 14-year-old or uh, Scarlet. And I think I would, I don't know how I'd feel. Would I like it? Would I feel like it's a, it's a waste? Is it, would, is it too much? Uh, would it depend on the writer? You know, would I unfairly be okay with it if somehow Larry Hama came back and wrote that arc? Um, but I do think this is pretty far afield. And I appreciate that if they're going to go out on a limb and tell a story about a character that I don't care for, uh, sort of before they're the character that we know, uh, that it's a short story. It's only two issues. And and as a top line, to- uh, we, we said this before we hit the record button, um, uh, what, a, what a fun change of pace for us it is to talk about just two issues and not four or five. And, and you touched on it there as well. The, the sort of interesting thing about this this two-issue arc, which is different to most of the G.I. Joe issues that have come before this, is that it is pretty much a straight out-and-out origins story. So there's been, you know, there's been origin-type stories within the ARA books from, from Larry Larry Hammer and most famously Snake Eyes, the origin, but those sort of stories have, gen- have generally been, you know, within the chronology of the existing storyline, the, the existing, you know, story brings back memories and brings back them, you know, th- thoughts and feelings, et cetera, which trigger a flashback or, or yeah, you know, this doesn't like, have frame looking back into the past. This is very much standalone and, and is just a more out and out, origin of this is the you know this is the uh, the time that they Zanya joined the dreadnoughts and met zartan for the first time and uh, and within that we've got some flash step backs down back to, to her um being slightly a uh, younger uh, a younger firebug Zanya. um so yeah quite a different approach to a typical joe story in terms of telling a fairly flat out and out break from the break from the regular present chronology and uh, and let's look back to the past and just tell a uh, an origin story did you guys um think it in this story that before um Zanya and kevin got in with the dreadnoughts that Zanya knew that zartan was the leader of the dreadnoughts because it's it's almost like she acts like uh she doesn't expect that like her mom had called her dad zartan you know so so she knew that that's what his name was but then they're all partying with the dreadnoughts and then here comes zartan comes out and he's like uh you know you know nobody's gonna party without me and the look on her face she's just like dad almost like she didn't expect it but then earlier like kevin was saying oh we're gonna be hanging out with zartan or whatever and it's like wouldn't that wouldn't she have made that connection then or I don't, I don't know. It seemed to me like in that last panel when she was like, dad, that it was almost like, oh my gosh, that's that's my, my dad there. I wasn't expecting to for him to be here. I didn't think he was the leader of the Dreadnoughts. So I think you know, I but, think she definitely knew that. It's just she she wasn't quite ready for that. Maybe again, it was of him walking into the room. Not she working. maybe didn't know he was going to be there. Wasn't quite steeled to that because I guess he's a big, bad, big wig. You know, yeah. the, the Dreadnoughts have got um gangs all over the country now at this point so so she didn't know he was going to be there per se and you know all of these years of anticipation you know you can't really prepare yourself for that moment it's always going to be a shock also um i think there's a mismatch here where mckeever ends chapter one on this one line of dialogue dad and her expression that she's surprised Right. And so it, in the language of comics, it has a certain kind of importance and it reads like a revelation or a cliffhanger when it is neither. It is a, it is a dramatic beat that she's surprised and upset. I think it would actually have a better resonance if there were more pages after it before uh, the end of the chapter or a cliffhanger and it could sit on its own. Uh, if you if you cut to another scene right after it, or if the scene were to continue to play for a page or two, and she's sort of hanging back and looking and sort of 
you know, internally deciding what to do or like Kevin's trying to talk to her and she's sort of uh, not listening. Um, I think the way that the scene with that, this, this, her, her saying dad is supposed to read is, um, you know, as Mark says, you're, you're at a, an event or a party and you see someone, um, you're, you're not expecting to, and then you're, or you're not ready for. Um, but I think as, as an issue, as the final panel and final page of a comic book, as the sort of cliffhanger of part one in a two part story in that regard, it doesn't work. But as a dramatic moment by itself, without that added import, import, uh, it it does. I do want to point out something that we haven't quite said yet, um, which is to McKeever's credit, and that this story jumps back and forth in time. Uh, it starts with her at age uh, not nine, and then jumps ahead to her when she's fourteen, and then goes back and forth between those two times, and and maybe where she's fourteen. Uh, or is it 15, uh, slightly moves ahead in time as, you know, she and Kevin are doing another job or, you know, initially seeing the, the dreadnoughts. Um, so as a dramatic device, as, as a, excuse me, as a structural device, um, the, the story has some oomph because it jumps back and forth. So how old is she supposed to be when we first meet her in number one? You guys know? There's uh there's one I forget where it was. There was one reference to like X years later or like X years ago, and I thought the number was six. I thought yes. the separation Page uh no sorry, page page three of the first part, uh after she's been sitting on the balcony uh watching the fire five years it later. flicks to five years later and then she's in that uh, right, fight thank you. that's being betted bet, bet on. And then we just don't really have any idea when this takes place in relation to you is, know, the current GI Joes. What would at that time be current? Is that is that uh, is that a problem, or are you just curious? Because you know we don't know how old any of the Joes well, and Cobra characters are. It again, it kind of goes back to the themes. There were parts in there where I had to wonder what kind of relationship her and Kevin had, and. That makes a big difference if she's only 14 years old. Uh, I think we can assume that uh, that they have a, a sexual relationship that is uh, inappropriate. And, and, you know, where G.I. Joe gets sort of uh, in a funny or necessary way sanitized, right? The Dreadnoughts don't drink beer. They drink grape soda. Uh, we can, since we don't see anything and there's no, uh, there's no, indication you know he's just using her as a fighter he's just psychologically manipulating her yeah yeah i don't I like don't, I said, I don't this think is a there's... sticky one this is a sticky one i don't I, yeah i don't know that we've got a definitive kind of age that we can pin on her in this, this story she could you know it's i guess late teens ish <laughs> you know some uh, but you know but but as to what, what the exact age is don't think i don't think we're given it enough to give away but there must be so so this would be set a little bit before so, i mean yeah, sometime that's kind of what be, I, what sometime I after issue sure. 155 but before uh issue one of the devil's due series because sort of Dar- zartan is in a bit more of his status quo as he you know he's outside of cobra for the most part and he's leading a gang of dreadnoughts which has got these locations scattered across um uh the, the US with a you know a rep behind them such that Kevin wants to to join them um, yeah and when we first encounter Zanya it's kind of in whatever issue, issue it is issue three or whatever it's kind of hinted at that that she's you know established within the, the the family that she's you know got got a good position there so so it's probably yeah a she few seems years like she's after, after this so it's yeah, maybe halfway integrated. point or something you know between between 155 and issue one would be my guess that kind I, of thing i'd like to write the story where uh, where duke in his uh, spook years crosses paths with zanya as as she's in her street fighter years and no no <laughs> uh, so um um we there's something else narratively 
which doesn't work for me. So Mark mentioned that the the pyromania or the the arson uh, arsonist tendency uh, gets set up and not quite followed through. And narratively, something that doesn't get followed through for me is how Kevin exits the story. Um, and I feel like all that's missing is one word balloon of dialogue or one panel. So um, Z- uh, Zanya and Kevin and Zorana, uh, and we, sh- we should talk about Zorana in this story because she, come- she becomes important in the second chapter. Uh, so the three of them are on this sort of test mission and they're going to break in and steal something. And uh, it turns out that it's a, it's a, it is a test. It's not an actual um, break, in, break in and entry, uh, excuse me, uh, break in and robbery um, that the lights turn on and the others are, t- uh, the other dreadnoughts are there and they're cheering on that um, uh, Xanya did it. Um, but uh, the, the, she splits off from Kevin um, and she punches him one, two, three, four, five, six times. Uh, she's tearing up as she does it. She's, her teeth are gritted. Her eyes are determined. And she opens her mouth and yet she says nothing. And I want to come back to that later. Um, he says, Zanya, when he turns around and sees her approaching and in three um, silent panels or sound effects, but she doesn't say anything. She doesn't, she doesn't scream or yell or growl or yell, say his name. Um, she punches him. And then uh, you turn the page and she says, we're looking past his knee. He's crumpled on the floor, I guess. And she's looking down at him crying and her fists are clenched. She says, leave, Kevin, leave and don't ever come back. And then in the next panel, she's walked away and she's cleared that distance. And she's now in some other part of the warehouse, 10 feet away, 30 feet away. We don't ever see Kevin again. And I, I think the implication from Jay talking about, you know, what the dreadnoughts would actually do is that, uh, like they pick him up and they shoot him in the head and they dump him in the river or they <laughs> pick him up and he's unconscious and they dump him somewhere and he is like terrified and he's, he's never going to try and contact the Dreadnoughts or Xanya again or they all just leave that warehouse and he wakes up and I guess it's a is it a Cobra warehouse because there are mores Cobra mores under those um uh, uh, curtains, right? She says, something's not right. I think these are just... Oh, sorry. Uh, excuse me. They're not mores. I thought they were from the shape. She says... Uh, he says, something's not right. I think these are just regular luxury boats. So, sorry. It's some it's some warehouse that the Dreadnoughts either already have control of or they've broken into so that they can be there at the finish line. But, um, uh, you know, maybe the Dreadnoughts just leave him there and, like, the police happen to come by the next day and they arrest him. Um, but... Um, we don't we don't it's not like we need to see his face to see how beaten and bruised he is and it's not like he necessarily nice, needs though. to and it's not like he needs to say something like you know n n n g zanya like mm, zanya no but the way that he disappears from the narrative so completely like i needed one more thing to get closure on him that he either does get away decidedly doesn't get away uh And, you know, that could be him, like, limping. That could be, like, one dreadnought saying one thing. Like, oi, we'll dump him outside. It's like, I just needed one more thing. Even if it's not 100% clear whether he's arrested, unconscious, uh, you know, scared, dead. I needed one more thing. And and in that regard, um, there's a narrative note at the end of the story doesn't work for me. uh, Which, fortunately, then gets sort of pushed aside. Because, as I said previously, the final uh, page uh, with Xanya and Zartan having a look is is so good okay um i think i've got one last point which is a nitpick um and that was that there was a moment <laughs> that when i read it i was just annoyed me um and this was um when uh, zanya's mother and her boyfriend were, were having a fight and he shouts at her always comparing me to the great zartan um and then later, uh, Zanya comes in and says, who's Zartan? Um, which just undermines the the previous point because they're in a cramped, you know, a, a cramped apartment. Clearly, 
you know, the, the, this, you know, in my, oh, yeah. my mom and her boyfriend are arguing a lot. And if she's always comparing him to the great Zartan, you'd think that Zanya would have picked up the name <laughs> and asked about it before. Um, so anyway, that's my nitpick. Mark double checked that one twice to make sure that's what he said. I have two error detected. Oh, crikey. Um, in uh, page, uh, issue 10, chapter 2, um, at the bottom of page 1, uh, from off panel, the, the bad boyfriend is yelling, I warned you, now shut your hole or I'll give you another one. And then on the next page, <laughs> another on the next page, uh, on the next page, the mom comes in and she has a black eye. And uh, black eyes aren't instantaneous. Black eyes are bruises. Bruises, you know, take a 20 minutes or an hour or a day to show up. And I think because of, um, you know, TV and movies and like makeup, you know, it's like if you're drawing comics, it's like, what's the shorthand for someone having been in a fight? Like, oh, a, a black eye. It's like, no, that didn't happen three minutes ago. It's not how black eyes work. Um, and then uh, on page 16 of this second chapter, issue 10, uh, when uh, find it. Um, uh, Jacksonville, it's a nighttime scene. It's the beginning of this test mission for um, uh, Zanya and Kevin as led by uh, Zorana. They're going to break into this uh, warehouse that has not just guards, but armed guards. Um, one, two, three, four. Um, the fourth panel on this page, um, they're having this back and forth. Oh, uh, uh, Zanya says, we can handle it. Just make sure you don't bust a hip on your way down there, granny. And Zarana says, maybe when I'm done with the gods, I'll give you a taste. And Zanya says, looking forward to it. And Kevin says, can you believe our luck? They're all whispering. Can you believe our luck? And she says, uh, Zanya says, yeah, some luck being babysat by that hag. And then the word balloon points back to Zanya. But clearly this is Kevin speaking because he uh -huh. says, yeah. No, I'm serious. The three of us out here alone, we could just take her out. Say it was an accident. Just like that, she's out of the picture. Um, so that is a lettering mistake, and editorial didn't catch it. Mm, and yeah, if uh, if the listener didn't reinterpret it themselves, which is what I did as I was, I was reading, um, it would shift the whole dynamic of that sort of denouement for the uh, denouement for the uh, the story of of its. You know, Kevin is is trying to betray the dreadnoughts you know, and, and trying to press pressurize Zanya in, into joining him. Whereas, yeah, if you were to believe that dialogue uh, trail, then uh, it was almost the other way around. Uh, Mark J, what do you think about Zorana uh, as a character and as a narrative device in these two issues? Because she's so much of a counterpoint to Zanya. I like her. Because the, the tension with her and Zanya is something that we've seen from the very beginning. From the very first issue, I think, uh, that, that they were together, which was probably 10 or, or 11, um, there's always been tension between these two. And, and um, you know, like Zanya's line about, you know, try it or, or whatever it was, uh, which one read the dialogue just a minute ago. I thought that was a great exchange. It was like, it, here's this little girl who's, she has a lot of different sides to her, which makes her more relatable by the end of the issue. Uh, she's vulnerable when she's with Kevin, but when she's presented with a female authority figure that probably kind of puts her in mind of her mom, which she maybe doesn't realize, she's real antagonistic. And she's not afraid to get up in Zanya's face at all. And she's not afraid to take on these huge guys in parking lots. But Kevin, the weasel has some kind of hold on her that she's not you know so again it's you, you you could get into stockholm syndrome and all this stuff with with her but yeah i liked zorana since you know, try to get back to zorana i liked her in this i've liked her consistently um i liked when the when she first came back in the malfunction arc how you know she was in um uh, in disguise and i think her uh, file card you know, talked about her being, uh, you know, using disguises and stuff. So I thought, yeah, that's great to, to go back to that. And yeah, I, I, I liked her. I think that they've really elevated her throughout um, the Devil's Do run to, 
I don't know, I mean, Larry used her a lot. Um, but I, I think that they kind of brought her forward more in this one than she had been before. And I, I like her as a character. I like the interaction between her and Sonya. Yep, I think I'm I'm on board with uh, Jay's comments on on that. Like her as generally as a as a character. Obviously, she's kind of you know here in this new dynamic. She's almost like a, a kind of a, a the the vice president of Dreadnought uh, PLC or whatever, um, and and is sort of a kind of uh, the protector. You know, the buffer between uh, uh, Zartan as as the big man and 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 uh, the the rest of the the, the Dreadnoughts and maybe Zanya's there is, you know, sort of a risk of usurping her, but, um, uh, and, and yeah, I think probably Zanya as well being quite happy with, uh, an antagonistic relationship. That's uh, something that's a little bit more open and honest and vulnerable is probably to a, her. yeah, it's more familiar to her and it's, you know, uh, to sort of having a, a yeah, more, more vulnerable caring relationship is probably a, less familiar and and more more scary but but also probably something that she ultimately wants, wants yeah. which is kind of that that last page of the, the the story where you've got kind of sort of steely eyes from from uh, uh zarana and, and then she's looking up to to zartan and he's smiling and she's sort of you know that that sort of final expression there of a kind of happiness and and hope for the future and you know finding her place uh, optimism uh, which is, you know, a nice place to leave it. Her happy ending, yeah. Mm. Um, I think that uh, there's a... So Zorana's well handled in this arc, and um, something that I haven't said yet that I do want to say about Xanya is that she doesn't speak a lot. She doesn't have a lot of dialogue. There are many panels of her in both the flashback and the sort of more present day flashback where uh, she's not saying anything. She's just tuning out what's happening because she's a kid alone while people are screaming in the next room or she's just observing what happens, right? So um, when she does, and, and this is a really important contrast because then when she does um, beat up that kid at school and, and scream at him, like, say you're sorry, say you're sorry, uh, when she does scream at Zartan to fight her, um, it has more of an impact because she has said less during the story. And it also sets up a contrast between her and uh, Kevin, as Mark said. You know, he's, he's all talk. And uh, she's, she's more um, all action. But my favorite line of dialogue, actually, and, and, and the sort of two or three most powerful moments for me in this two-issue arc... Uh, are when um, she either doesn't do something or she does something and and says very little about it because she's such a damaged but vicious character. So her mom's about to, to beat her uh, near the end of the fi- in a, in a flashback near the end of the fi- second final chapter, um, and her mom um, is telling her to bend over so she can whoop her, and Zanya says no. And I thought. Uh, what a great line of dialogue and for you know any reader who identifies with a kid who's being mistreated by authority figures like what a what a powerful turn um so uh i think the fact that uh, mckeever has her saying so little um when she's when she's being hurt and when she's hurting is uh, is a is a, uh, is a is a great writing choice I think are we are we done with talking about the main bits of this this uh, arc now? Shall I move on to I Spy? Sure. I, I spy, spy with, with my, my little, little eye. eye. Okay. I have spied three things. Thing number one: uh, the principal is Principal Norton, who is presumably named after Mike Norton, uh, on staff at Devil's Due, the graphic designer for this issue um there is a lovely moment at the dreadnought party because everyone loves a dreadnought party um norgahide has his beer tankard with uh, a fur edge to it sort of matching uh, the rest of his uh his look i think that might be a is that a tiki mug with a fur 
And sorry, no, that's sorry, that's a that's a regular fancy beer stein. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, so it's a fancy beer stein with uh, with fur fur edging to it, and a G for Norguide, I guess. Um, classy. Keep it. We classy had, uh, and my third thing was a young Zanya when she was playing with her Matchbox. Uh, it was branded Max Matchbox Twenty, which is of course. Uh, a rock band. Um, I have a question for I Spy. Uh, on the first page of Chapter 2, Issue 10, uh, she's watching cartoons on TV. And uh, so Francis Portella has drawn a sort of a cartoon mouse with a mallet hitting a cartoon cat, like in front of a brick wall. Um, this, is, this is just made up, right? This isn't anything real like Ren and Stimpy, and it's not supposed to remind us of anything I think so. Real. I think so. I think possibly there might be some Easter eggs in the background elsewhere um, where there's like posters and she's reading a comic and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I I guessed that this is just, yeah, kind of just showing up a trope, an analog for Tom and Jerry. Um, And then another question for I Spy. Um, Are we seeing, um, are we seeing burnout, the Dreadnought burnout in some of these scenes? I think we might be. Probably. Yeah. We've seen him before. Um, does Burnout have um, facial hair? Yeah, he does, doesn't he? Hold on. I'm, I'm... But yeah, I guess he's younger in uh, this story. <laughs> no prize it. There you go. Uh, yeah, which... Yeah, okay. And, you know, people shave. <laughs> Although... I... I... Although I think I've said this before, uh, there there are certain rules for facial hair in GI Joe. If you have a beard, you can't completely lose a beard. You can go to a goatee. If you don't have a beard, uh, I'm not sure you should grow one. Because if I see some blonde Joe with a with a blonde mustache, I'm not going to think, "Oh, Duke grew a beard." I'm going to think that's rock and roll. You know, but if so rock like, and roll shaves it all off, he becomes Duke. <laughs> right and and you know like duke gets brown hair for tiger force and i'll never understand low light getting black hair for his his, his later figure um uh so uh particularly with the dreadnoughts it's like the, really the only the only change is uh you know mainframe can go in a later continuity from clean shaven to a goatee though i don't like it um and you can go from a beard to a goatee or a goatee to a beard you go from a mustache to a goatee or a goatee to a mustache but uh, I don't think Dreadnought's burnout can grow a beard as he gets, uh, excuse me, a goatee as he gets older. Um, this also may not be uh, burnout, but if it is, um, I have an eye spy in that same, in that same panel where uh, Nagahide is holding his uh, beer stein with the fur, the fuzzy um, base. Uh, the Dreadnoughts have mugs or beer steins with the Dreadnought logo on them. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, I don't know anything about, you know, um, like Hell's Angels uh, or or biker gangs. Uh, I assume nowadays the way that like everyone can, you know, get like t-shirts and and merchandise and hats with their logo made. That's really easy to do now. You know, 20, 30 years ago, it was was more complicated. And I I don't know if a group like the Hell's Angels did that in the you know 70s 80s 90s but um the, either you know they're making their own equipment or they're like ordering it from some company you know it's like someone someone in the dreadnoughts if they're not like making their, their own branded mugs and beer steins is ordering from some company it's like 500 mugs or beer steins with the dreadnought logo on it but yeah you know and they're all they're all about the branding the, the dreadnoughts that's true. There's a uh, there's a figure waiting to happen. Uh, Dreadnought printer. Or yeah. Yeah, he's 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 called Brander, and he's he's got <laughs> any... he's got like a, a sort of big <laughs> iron branding iron that uh, that he burns. The I think Brander. <laughs> I think Brander. Uh, so he could also be Brand because you know Torch Torch's code name is Torch, not like torture. Although Buzzer and Ripper's toward na- code names aren't Buzz and Rip, um, so Brander or Torture Brand, has a ring to it. I think I think Brander would have a giant um, 
Dreadnought logo uh, tattoo on his chest. So I think he's going to have a, like a vest or an down. open shirt in terms of character design. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe like into the sides of his hair, he's got shaved. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe he's branded his own chest with the Dreadnought <laughs> logo. That's, uh, mm-hmm. that's hardcore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's, okay. Right. We so, know hardcore on Talking Joe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're all about the hardcore. Um, so uh, uh, let's uh, let's pop open some uh, cans of uh, grape soda on uh, on this uh, arc and uh, give it a uh, uh, a grape soda scoring out of ten. <laughs> I'll go first. I'm just yeah. biting my tongue. I, like I said, I've, I have a I have a hard time with this story. You know, there was. I, I enjoyed it, but it was like, we're dealing with, like I said, we're dealing with some really dark stuff. And it's just, is it is it out of place? Um, would it not feel as disjointed if the art were different? I think probably, uh, even though I do think the artist is good. I don't know. There's a lot that, I... I I'm thinking six, probably. I really can't go any higher than that, but I don't want to go low because I did enjoy it, and it was nice to see. It was, it was strange because, like Tim said, he didn't like the character. I really didn't care one way or another. She hadn't been in enough scenes to make a difference. Uh, but by the end of this, I I did like her, and that was kind of a problem because it was like, oh well, like I said, and you know, in the plot breakdown, that was kind of a joke. You know, everyone lived happily ever after because it's like, ah, oh, look the. The little abused girl got taken in by the outlaw biker gang. It, we're going to have a happy ending. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't see a happy ending ever for these characters. So you know, but you're like at the end, it's like oh, like they're gummy bears or something. It's like, what am I? What what is the artist or the what is the writer trying to make me feel at the end of this? I I don't feel like that. I don't feel like I should root for these characters necessarily. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just kind of all over the place. It's too, it's, it, it, it plays with you too much to, to be real successful. Um, as I said before, uh, good two issue story, uh, as GI Joe, uh, not good for me. So it's hard to give this a number. Um, you know, I wouldn't mind rereading this to think of Jay's, uh, metric. I wouldn't mind rereading this sort of as comics, but uh, you know, I'd rather these two issues have been spent doing something else for G.I. Joe. So, um, but, you know, McKeever does some great writing and uh, Portella is off to a, a good start, uh, a great start um, in drawing and storytelling, even if he's not the right artist for this story. Uh, years later, he drew um, a run on Black Panther, which I was reading at the time, which I liked. So I'll say five, five chocolate donuts and five grape sodas. Yeah, so so I think echoing what you guys have said um, as I was reading this, it was I just wasn't getting in, enthused. Um, didn't dislike it. Didn't think it was bad per se, but just uh, found it difficult to get excited about. Um, I think we touched on the fact that you know, a couple of you know storytelling maybe just isn't isn't quite the the GI Joe story that that we want to see and the, the artist maybe wasn't the right one for this particular story with, with a different artist, perhaps I might give it a couple of more points. Um, so, so I think a fairly flat five grape sodas being opened without too much fizz. Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, people will talk about what, what they, what kind of GI Joe they want. And some people want more, um, of a real world uh, military kind of handling and that's kind of the, the what I would really like to see is something a little more uh, grounded in, in reality and more you know gritty not not necessarily uh, but just more realistic and this is a story that would fit in that but doesn't necessarily fit in this continuity you know where we've got little bits of the comic book we've got little bits of the cartoon yeah but there's just there's a lot of we could make a list of adult themes in this two issue arc 
that would put an episode of Law and Order to shame. <laughs> okay. Um, next up, I think we have got Innuendo. <laughs> Attention, at this moment you are now listening to a Talking innuendo If you are offended by words like Sucking Flesh wound Willy Pete Balls Crystal balls Hypno shield Whatever Take the tape out now This is not a pop album And by the way Suck my Grandmother's mother's brick in a Prada handbag So if you're in the right frame of mind, uh, specifically my frame of mind, a lot of G.I. Joe names can sound a little bit dirty. And in this segment, I read a list of uh, G.I. Joe names to see if I can make my co-hosts ditter. And uh, I've been going through my my list these last few uh, weeks and and months, and I'm pretty much at at an end. So... um, think this segment will probably be retired for for a little while but i have got something uh in mind to uh bring the gi jokes uh to um to to the show um (laughs) so uh if you steal yourself get ready for the last innuendo which is a list of one so i'm i'm betting big here on this one list okay on on this one one usually does it let's be honest so here we go Cutter's Whale (laughs) Thank you Jay I told you (laughs) Uh, I just want to point out uh, on a completely unrelated note uh, (laughs) since I to to just get this back to comics uh, since I'm always ready to talk about uh, coloring and uh, you know 1990s and early 2000s coloring that goes too far Listeners, if you if you have this if you have the single issue in front of you, not the collection, uh, not digital, uh, issue ten, chapter two of this, um, the inside back cover is an ad for uh, that October's issue of Micronauts, and uh, this is a good example of uh, an overcolored image because <laughs> every single shape, every contour of every character's Helmets and shoulder armor and chest armor Ugh. has uh, has a highlight and uh, a gradient on it, uh, and also the laser beams, uh, the black outlines have have been turned into like light blue or light yellow. Uh, so the, nothing to do with GI Joe, uh, nothing to do with uh, Inuendo, um, but uh, uh, it's, I thought it's the, some I thought horrible the, coloring. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I thought the I thought the coloring so it's related. <laughs> I thought the coloring was good uh, in this in this two issue uh, arc. Um, uh, did you? I, sorry, I, uh, <laughs> I he didn't I thought he didn't was, not like it. Yeah, <laughs> in this I uh, thought this was like I said I thought it was just way too bright. It was too colorful, especially for the story. Uh, well, okay, so I mean, going hand in hand with art that doesn't fit, but in terms of like. Um, in terms of, uh, it's not as yeah. I, I got yeah. There, there aren't there aren't. Um, it's not uh, overdone like some of the other stuff that we. Well, seen. let me let me let me call out two things. So you know the the flashbacks where she's in a little kid and she's in her apartment. Um, everything is uh, cast with a yellow light, and then the scene where uh, the three of them are breaking in on this uh, test to like steal the boats. You know everything is colored uh, with a sort of um, dark blue, dark green. So. Uh, the scenes have a different visual vocabulary in terms of coloring. Is it my favorite coloring? No. Is it great? N- no. Uh, is it bad? No. It's just it's just sort of like, eh. This actually reminds me of um, uh, this actually reminds me of uh, this. This is not going to be a helpful uh, comparison for anyone, but three people in in Massachusetts. This just reminds me of like DC <laughs> Comics house coloring circa 2012 where um, uh, a lot of things aren't quite one color or the other. They're sort of like between two colors, like that panel where Nagahide... Look at me, I'm complaining about the coloring now. The, the panel where Nagahide is holding his, uh, his stein with the, fuzzy, um, with the fuzzy base, you know, like 
just that complexion on Naga Hide. It's sort of uh, desaturated, and then the background is just sort of a pale, I don't know, yellow, green, gray. Um, so uh, the coloring gets the job done, and and there's nothing, uh, there's nothing egregious, and a lot of it is fine. Geez, that that turned that turned out negatively. <laughs> yeah, uh, great great way to end the show. Thanks, thanks. Dude, I got so, one more thing. I got one more thing, real quick. I mean, um, I I, I, wanna, I laugh at, I laugh out loud at the really? Micronauts cover uh, on the on the inside back cover because it's so like it's so bad it becomes something else, you know. Yeah. Like Sorry, a movie yeah. that you just sit and cut up on. Uh, you know who else this artist kind of looks like to me is I. I'm not. I can't remember exactly whether it's. I think that it's Philip Bond, that did several mm-hmm. issues of The Invisibles with Grant Morrison, and then yeah. maybe a one shot like Kill Your Boyfriend for Vertigo. Is that Philip? Yeah. There's certain panels in here where the art kind of looks like you know the way that he does faces and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, the the faces also and some of the line work remind me of Gabriel Rodriguez's work, who uh, who draws who has drawn uh, Lock, Lock and Lock Key. And Key. Yeah, I was thinking yeah. the same. Yeah. Uh, um, but this the, this this predates that, right? Yeah, yeah, by a long shot. Oh yeah, for sure. The the other thing that was reminding me of a little bit was uh, Queen and Country by Greg Rucker, and it was I, I don't know if it was I can't remember if it was like the first arc or the second arc, but there was an artist that was quite cartoony and to, to me didn't really fit the tone of the the book and kind of kind of killed that book for me because I couldn't really get past uh, past the style of the art despite the strength of the storytelling. Are you thinking of Steve Ralston? It's, it is probably the Steve Ralston uh, arc, which was the I think the first volume. But yeah, it's been yeah, a few years so, since. Then. So uh, you know, there's a there's a softness and a slickness to how Francis Pratella draws these two issues, uh, both the pages that he inks and the pages inked by um, someone else. And uh, the right GI Joe story, you know, from Devil's Do at that time. Uh, a different Devil's Due G.I. Joe story uh, could be a real home run for, for this artist. Um, but, you know... Um, like you know, a flashback th- with Roadblock and his cooking show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, again, I, I, you know... Something like uh, that, you know? Mark, Mark said the word... Something lighthearted. Mark said the word grit at the beginning. And, you know, think of... Everyone, think of listeners, Mark, Jay. Think of, think of artists who um, have a, a scratchy style, a mm-hmm. messy style... Um, a busy style who use a lot of black ink, who use a lot of shadows. Leonardo um, Manco, one th- of my there favorites. Are, there are there are there are many artists who you know if they were available and wanted to take this job, uh, I think the way that they draw. Also, mm-hmm. I actually think that Francis Portella is good enough that if someone had offered a different take on this job, I don't know what his marching orders were. I don't know if this is just sort of how he drew, but. You know, a lot of comics artists, if you say to them, like, oh, make this, like, grittier or, like, no, no, make this prettier, um, could try that. So this isn't even, like, uh, necessarily that Francis Portella was incapable of doing this a different way in 2003. Um, and, and just, I don't, I don't know if it was intentional from you, Jay, or not, but um, you've got issue 18 to look forward to, which is uh, Roadblock on his cooking show. <laughs> No, I had no idea. That's awesome. Drawn drawn by Mike Norton, right? Uh, Tim, uh, yeah, oh, written great. by I'm Tim Seeley. Get with what I want. Art by Mike Norton. Yeah, and Mike Norton Principal has a Mike Norton. Mike Norton has a. <laughs> I, I don't. I say this as a compliment. A sort of cartoony. I mean, it's sort of halfway between cartoony and American adventure style, mm-hmm. uh, but an open, clean uh, style that feels a little bit more like. Uh, you know, G.I. Joe animation than like a Joe Kubert, mm, yeah. you know, gritty yeah, comic sure. book style. Okay, let's stick a pin in uh, this episode uh, because uh, we will be back again uh, next week uh, when we will be continuing our ongoing adventures in comics. We've got art shows coming up. We've got uh, the a real American hero issues from Larry Hammer being covered as they come out, and we will continue to cover um, the frontline issues. So the next arc, I'm very much looking forward to to rereading for the first time in a good few years. Uh, it's uh, Brandon Jerwood's first arc uh, for GI Joe, 
ever, in fact, uh, and uh, his introduction on Frontline Issue 11, History Repeating, an arc of four issues. Um, so, yeah, that's that's that. Um, where can people find you, Jay? Break Room Sketches on Facebook. And Tim, what are the numerous places that people can find out more about you and your different yin and yang aspects to your life? <laughs> You're muted. All right, Tim. Thanks for playing along. Or you're just disgusted by that introduction. <laughs> in person at Hub Comics in Somerville, Massachusetts, right outside Boston, hubcomics.com. And uh, my blog is a realamericanbook.com. Very good. Um, you can find all about the show and the usual places. Talkingjoe.co.uk is the website that has a list and links to all of those places. We're on Facebook, so if you're not a member of the Facebook group yet, join in the fun over there. We're on Twitter, Instagram, and also on YouTube as well. So if you only listen to the audio-only version of this show, be sure to check out the YouTube version, which has got uh, lots of images from the books and so on. Um, we're also on Patreon, patreon.com, Talking Joe, and a big thanks, as always, to our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, and Justin, who are getting early access to episodes, as well as some exclusive content. And that's us done. But remember... <laughs> Ironically, Tim forgets. Uh, nobody means Talking Joe! A real American podcast! with a guy from England too. Latest tomatoes. I liked wankers better. <laughs> <laughs> it was better when you said wankers. I thought the story arc was too gritty for you, Jay. <laughs> too many adult themes, wankers. <laughs> I'm in that mode now. What can I do? Oh dear. <laughs>